This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. What's up guys, Michael here. Today, we're gonna talk about what will likely be the most important film this year to feature sentient rocks. And no, we, we don't mean Dwayne. We're talking about everything, everywhere, all at once, or as we like to call it, Michelle Yeoh and the Multiverse of Sadness. This isn't the first movie to use the multiverse as a storytelling device. But while some of these other films might be accused of, I don't know, using the multiverse as a way to backdoor corporate IP into increasingly flimsy narratives, everything, everywhere, all at once is different. It uses the multiverse to say some genuinely interesting things about everything from 24 seven digital culture to how sometimes parents just don't understand. One of the film's directors even said it explores his own adult ADHD diagnosis and its effects on his life. But what really stood out to us is the way the film explores two of our favorite philosophical sensibilities, existentialism and nihilism. And while we've talked about these two spicy meatballs or hot dog fingers before, everything everywhere all at once does something super interesting in using the multiverse to explore the metaphysical implications of the aforementioned meatballs. So does this film use the multiverse to show us a way out of existential despair? Or should we all be praying for nihilist bagels to put us out of our misery? Let's find out in this Wisecrag edition on everything, everywhere, all at once. Does anything mean anything anywhere? And of course, major spoilers ahead for the movie. But before we dive in, I want to tell you about this week's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN keeps your data secure with cutting edge VPN protocols and uncrackable encryption. Now, one of my favorite things about Surfshark is the way it keeps my location totally private. And when websites can't figure out where in the world I'm located, that means they can't hike up prices for things like plane tickets just based on how much they think I can afford. Instead, I can connect my secure Surfshark VPN to VPNs in different countries until I score a good deal. And the same logic applies to watching streaming movies and TV shows too. With a secure VPN, it doesn't matter if the movie or show I want to see has been released in the US yet. Instead, I can join an international VPN to get that sweet, sweet content. One subscription covers all of your favorite devices, like your laptop, Android, Amazon Fire Stick, PlayStation, and more. Plus, you can still use your favorite apps like Firefox and Chrome. Get started by clicking the link in the description and using the promo code WISECRACK. When you do, you can get Surfshark VPN for 83% off plus three extra months for free. Go to surfshark.deals slash wisecrack or hit the link in the description. Protect yourself online and download Surfshark VPN today. And now, back to the show. Let's start with the film's central characters, the Wang family. You've got serious and stressed Evelyn, her goofy but good-hearted husband, Waymond, and their angsty daughter, Joy. Each of these characters is going through their own type of existential crisis right off the bat. And that's before the fabric of reality starts to unravel. Evelyn embodies a type of mundane existential despair as she's seemingly depressed at the state of her life and keenly aware of what she hasn't accomplished. She very much has the vibes of a character from a Sartre or Camus novel. We even learn that she's the only Evelyn in the multiverse who never excelled at anything. With every passing moment, you feel you might have missed your chance to make something of your life. And during an IRS meeting, we see that she hasn't let go of various failed dreams. You're also a novelist and a chef. Last time you told me no, that. that please. And then we have Joy. When we first meet her, she's feeling alienated from her mother, both interpersonally and also at the level of wanting her queerness to be recognized. But later on, we'll know her as Jobu Topaki once her mind is shattered and exists in every iteration of the multiverse. While the original Joy is just looking for meaning in her everyday life, Jobu Topaki is on a search for meaning at the cosmic level. Existing in every multiverse has left her convinced Everything is random, nothing means anything, and there is no truth. And finally, we have Waymond, who at first doesn't appear to suffer as deeply as his wife and daughter, but he does seem dejected by the loss of love in his marriage. Rather than seeking some type of cosmic meaning or purpose, this dude just wants to love and be loved. So to really get to the bottom of what these characters are going through, we need to revisit our old friends, existentialism and nihilism. Now we've covered these topics in the past and if you need a primer, check out our classic video on Rick and Morty and Bojack 
written by yours truly. But something we haven't talked about before is what the early existentialists were responding to, namely rationalist and idealist schools of thought that believed the structure of reality was something that was knowable through human consciousness, i.e. that we could make sense of everything which is what philosophers call metaphysics. The two most notable proto-existentialists, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, came right after the era of German idealism, during which a crew of philosophers tried to figure out the nature of the absolute. Put differently, they were trying to logically comprehend everything, everywhere, all at once. Corny, sure, but an apt description of what philosophers like Hegel and Fichte were doing? Absolutely. And these idealist philosophers offered an account of both how human consciousness works, but also how the reality outside of our consciousness functions. In their minds, they had more or less reached the final boss of philosophy. But for some of the folks that came in their wake, the idea that individual human minds could somehow comprehend all the features of reality was a humorous illusion at best. They weren't ready to go full to pocket. And even those who thought these absolute idealists were onto something still thought that this level of rational understanding wasn't making folks any less miserable. We see parallels in the film's antagonist, Jobu Tapaki. Jobu is able to experience everything that's happening at all times, but instead of giving her some greater sense of truth or meaning, it's made her absolutely miserable, turning her into a nihilist with a penchant for experimental fashion and creative murders. And this makes us think about a fellow traveler of the existentialist, Albert Camus. What his friends Jean-Paul Simone and Maurice described as the existential condition, he called the absurd. The absurd describes what happens when there is a contradiction between two ideals. For example, humanity's desire for meaning and purpose and the universe's seemingly cold and meaningless structure. Not to get too trippy, but it's basically what happens if you're sitting underneath the stars with someone you love. That feeling of love seems super meaningful when you're gazing at your beloved. But when you turn and stare up at the seemingly lifeless infinity of our universe, it's hard to not wonder if human meaning is just a pleasant delusion we all share. Or if you're Joe Butapaki, the absurd is the contradiction between thinking that your individual life has some sort of meaning and then experiencing the seeming randomness and meaninglessness of life across the multiverse. For Evelyn, it could be the contradiction between her mundane and unfulfilling life and seeing that in another timeline, she's a movie star. Now, this contradiction drives Jobu to bagel-centered nihilism, which we'll get back to in a second, but that wasn't Camus' journey. He thought that the individual could face the absurd in three ways. Suicide, and to be clear, he did not endorse this, and there is no reading of the existentialist tradition that endorses ending your own life. A leap of faith, in which you turn to religion for meaning, or a type of recognition or rebellion in which you acknowledge the utter absurdity of existence, but are still able to discover meaning at the individual level. It's sort of embracing the paradox that while the universe might have no inherent meaning, you're going to keep searching for some meaning nonetheless. Kind of like searching for your soulmate at a funeral. In this way, Camus' absurdism is neither as cosmically hopeless as nihilism, nor as positive in its embrace of freedom and humanity as existentialism. At a certain point in the movie, it seems like Jobu and Evelyn have chosen Camus' very dark first option, as Jobu's despair makes her want to simply be sucked into the empty void of the bagel. Rather than face the absurdity of their situation, they'd prefer not to exist at all. Because as we see during Evelyn's laundromat rampage, what's the point? For some contemporary theorists, Camus' solution is kind of a cop-out. He comes close to embracing absolute cosmic meaninglessness, but he doesn't go all the way. One such theorist is writer Eugene Thacker, who in his aptly titled In the Dust of This Planet, argues that there might not be a purpose to things or to your life, or to your existence, or to the cosmos, that there might not be an order, that we're not here for a reason, that it's arbitrary and an accident. For Thacker, this cosmic nihilism leads to a philosophy of pessimism, which takes a largely negative view of life and existence. Pessimists believe that the conditions of existence often make life pretty shitty for most people most of the time. This seems to be the vibe of Jobu's crew of circle-headed weirdos. Because life is shit anyways, they embrace being sucked into the hole of a heavily seasoned bagel. 
Philosopher Ray Brassier takes this pessimistic view even further in his understanding of our desire for meaning. As he sees it, because we can be scientifically certain that eventually the sun is going to die out and explode, there will be an inevitable heat death to the universe and Earth will be cosmically canceled. In this process, all human consciousness and history and thought and art and everything else is going to be destroyed forever and rendered cosmically meaningless. And in light of this cosmic bummer, we need to reconsider our desire for meaning and maybe reconsider the idea that real meaning is something that we can ever find in the first place. Basically, if the bagel is eventually going to suck it all into oblivion anyways, none of what's happening now really matters all that much, does it? Classic existentialism, absurdism, and nihilism are all about what we should do practically and ethically if life is meaningless. But there are contemporary philosophers who have functionally turned existentialism back into a kind of metaphysics. Remember, the very thing existentialism developed in opposition to. Basically, if existentialism was more about how we should live, metaphysics consists of classic questions about the meaning of reality. Now, the metaphysical implications of thinkers like Thacker and Brassier would, of course, be ideal reading for Jobu and the Bagel Gang's book group. They basically confirm Jobu's nihilistic metaphysics by arguing that the cosmos is a cold, uncaring nothing, and that life is mostly pain and despair with a few little moments of happiness sprinkled here and there. And like we already said, at a certain point, it seems like Evelyn wants in on the book group as well. But she snaps out of it due to Wayman's simple but effective plea for everyone to just be kind. It's the only thing I do know is that we have to be kind. And while this could strike some as corny and reductive, as if being kind is a cure to large-scale metaphysical meaninglessness, it actually gets at something important. Now, for Thacker and Brassier, pessimism and nihilism aren't just existential principles, but metaphysical and even scientific ones. Because when everything humanity has ever created is burned like a bagel left in the toaster too long, nothing we will have ever done is really gonna matter. And all attempts to find happiness and purpose in the meantime are equivalent to closing your eyes and listening to a mildly interesting podcast as your plane hurdles towards the ground. But this, of course, isn't where the Wang family ends up. Evelyn, inspired by Wayman's unceasing optimism and calls for kindness in the face of fear, decides that existence is something worth fighting for. And rather than using her homicidal pinkies to take out her enemies, she responds with a love and kindness that seems to target the fear and despair motivating her opponents. And maybe, not surprisingly, some recent French philosophers, the children and grandchildren of the existentialists, so to speak, are using the spirit of existentialism to combat the metaphysics of nihilist despair. Okay, so it's like this. The existentialist operated with the principle that the true nature of reality was basically unknowable. And trying to understand it would just make us miserable because we'd always experience the contradiction between our subjectivity and the objective nature of reality. Instead, we should focus on making decisions and taking responsibility for our own existence. And anyways, why worry about metaphysics when you can drink martinis? But contemporary philosophers like Alain Badiou and Quentin Miasu are both continuing to embrace the power that decisions play in existence while also embracing metaphysics. And while it's kind of a lot of complicated stuff, the gist is that while the existentialist focused on the inconsistency between reality and our attempts to understand it, this newer crop of French smarties identify that inconsistency as a feature of reality itself. In one sense, it seems like there is a lack of freedom in the everything, everywhere, all at once multiverse, as each version of Evelyn seems borderline destined to carry out a specific type of existence. But Beju would argue that while each of these universes seems to have finite limits, within each universe, there is a transfinite sense of possibility. Put simply, while we would normally consider the distance between the numbers one and two to be a finite limit, within that limit, there is an infinite amount of numbers, i.e. 1.0, 1 1.34, 1.5, 1.0009804356, etc. In existential terms, this means that even if we're caught in a certain finite condition, i.e. we have hot dogs for fingers, we still have infinite possibilities within those conditions, i.e. 
we can learn to play the piano with our feet. For Beju, this means that novel things can happen in seemingly finite situations. And when these things happen under what he calls the four conditions of truth, art, love, science, and politics, we're capable of finding ideas that can give our lives meaning. And these ideas share something with existentialism and that we can't simply believe in them like they're true or false. Rather, we need to take responsibility for the consequences of these ideas in our own lives. At the end of the film, Evelyn and Joy's futures aren't certain just because they've decided to avoid annihilation by Bagel. They'll have to stay faithful to their decision each day as they continue to find meaning in their lives. And Miyasu argues that rather than reality being either a chaotic, meaningless mess or a well-ordered system of necessary truth and causation, it is both contingent and necessary. Or as he puts it, the only necessity is contingency. To put it in terms a raccoon chef could understand, it's not that reality doesn't make sense because we're not capable of understanding it. It's that reality simply doesn't make sense in a clearly logical way. It's basically a metaphysics reverse engineered out of existentialism. And this view of reality seems to be there in the scene in the movie that really made me cry a lot. Here all we get are a few specks of time where any of this actually makes any sense. Here, Evelyn and Jobu are able to acknowledge that reality doesn't make sense and at the same time, there is space for them to create their own meaning and purpose. Then I will cherish these few specks of time. And everything everywhere all at once seems to be saying precisely this, that even though the universe doesn't have any inherent sense of order or meaning, that within the context of these seemingly random contingencies, we are capable of creating meaning. And when we get scared or feel stupid because reality and existence don't make sense to us, the problem isn't us, it's that reality itself is kind of a mess. So does everything everywhere all at once end up confirming that the universe is inherently meaningful and that if we just look hard enough, meaning and truth will be right there waiting for us? Absolutely not. But the film isn't coldly embracing nihilism. Instead, it seems to be taking the route of arguing that just because reality doesn't come preloaded with meaning doesn't mean that we can't create truth in our own lives. But what do you all think? Is everything everywhere all at once a necessary tonic for a time when reality feels pretty warped to begin with? Or were you just wondering when the superheroes were gonna show up? Let us know in the comments. Thanks to our patrons for all your support, and don't forget to check out our new perks on Patreon. And also check out our new stream, Wisecrack Live, right here, Thursdays, 11 a.m. Pacific time. Press that subscribe button like you're sticking a googly eye to your forehead, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching, later.